making insoluble salts or precipitation. Uh, the basic procedure of uh, making the insoluble salts is actually to mix two soluble salts. And what it gives us is an insoluble salt and a soluble one. For example, as you can see over here, we are mixing so silver nitrate and sodium chloride. Both silver nitrate and sodium chloride are soluble salts. What it gives us is an insoluble salt, as you can see the solid sign over here, and a soluble salt. Of course, sodium nitrate is soluble, that's why they equate sign. We call it a precipitation reaction. A precipitate is a solid that is formed by a chemical reaction, which may involve uh, liquids, solutions, gases, or even solids. A precipitation reaction is simply a reaction that produces a precipitate. In this reaction, what we get is a white precipitate, as you can see on your left, and silver chloride doesn't dissolve in water, so there is a white solid that is formed, and slowly that settles down to the bottom of this test tube. Now, let's explain what's happening over here. Silver nitrate actually contains two kinds of ions, silver ions, the positive ones, cations, and the anions are nitrate ions. The positive and negative ions are attracted to each other, of course, because of their uh, attractions, but the attractions aren't strong enough to make them stick together. Similarly, similar, so sodium chloride solutions contain sodium ions and chloride ions. Again, the attractions are strong enough to stick them together. When you mix two solutions, the various ions meet each other. When silver ions meet chloride ions, the attractions are so strong that the ions clump together and form a solid. The sodium and nitrate ions remain in the solution because they are not sufficiently attracted to each other. So that's what happens when a precipitation reaction goes, which means the attraction of silver ion with chloride ion is much more that as compared to what it has for nitrate ion. Now, what we do over here is that we keep the water molecules in the solution left out to avoid cluttering of the diagram. So you can't see any water molecules over here, but as you can see that the silver ions and the chloride ions are sticking together and the sodium and nitrate ions are actually fall apart. So they actually stick to the solution. So what happens is that we get a precipitate, a white colored precipitate in fact, of silver nitrate. Of the silver chloride, my bad. Now, an agonic equation for a precipitation reaction is much easier to write than the full equation. All that is happening is the ions of insoluble salt are coming together to form the solid. So what we are supposed to do is that we can write down the formula of the precipitate on the right-hand side of the equation and we can simply write the ions that would react together to form it. Let's take an example. Like, just like given over here, we know that the silver chloride is actually the precipitate over here and hence the solid sign. So what are you supposed to do? You're simply supposed to react silver ions with chloride ions. So let's write silver ions. Let's write chloride ions. They will react together to form silver chloride. And of course, silver ions were first soluble in water because they were a part of silver nitrate, and chloride ions were soluble in water because they were a part of sodium chloride. So silver ions in aqueous form, chloride ions in aqueous form give us the silver chloride precipitate, the solid one. The same thing happens to barium and sulfate ions to form a white precipitate of barium sulfate. Remember, uh, in the previous chapter, we were discussing which salts are soluble in water and which are salts usually aren't. So we gave a lot of examples. There were some sulfate salts, some carbonate salts, uh, some chloride salts, which were insoluble in water. And let me tell you, whenever there are two ions of the same salt in a system, they possibly tend to come together to form a precipitate. So that's why silver chloride forms a precipitate, uh, barium sulfate forms a precipitate, uh, apart from the carbonates of sodium, potassium, and ammonium, all the carbonates make a precipitate. You don't need to worry about the spectral ions because they aren't doing anything. So uh, we can safely say that actually sodium ions and nitrate ions were the spectral ions in this case, in this specific equation that we were discussing about, right? So you should be able to write ionic equations 
you can use the previous method of cutting the whole thing out, but uh, this one is an easier one. That's why they talk about writing the ionic equations of respiration reactions are much easier to write than the full equations. Moving on. What do we mix together to make insoluble salts? Our procedure for making insoluble salts is to mix together two solutions containing soluble salts, of course. But what are we going to mix together? How would we know what are we supposed to mix together? To determine this, there are two really useful facts over here. Our nitrates are soluble, all sodium potassium salts are soluble. Most of the ammonium salts are also soluble, all right? So uh, we'll have to mix the nitrate of the metal part of insoluble salt with the sodium and potassium salt of the non-metal part to mix them together. For example, if we are supposed to make lead to iodide, that means PBI2. So what are we going to do? Uh, the metal part is lead, so we're going to use nitrate of it. The non-metal part is iodide, so we're going to either use sodium iodide or potassium iodide. But that would be easy enough for you to know which salts you're going to uh, mix. And of course, they're going to be the soluble ones to form your precipitate. There you go. So you, we can see the yellow precipitates of lead to iodide and the ionic equation is then pretty easy to write. So working out the ionic equation and actually putting the soluble ions with that, as we know, all nitrates are soluble and as we know, sodium or potassium ions are soluble. So it would be very easier for you to think of the ionic equation as well as to uh, think of the salts that we are supposed to mix together to form the precipitates. So actually both things work in conjunction and it's pretty easy to determine the salts as well as to write the equation. Let's move on. Barium sulfate. We're gonna use barium nitrate and we're gonna use the sulfate with sodium or potassium. Here we have the example of potassium. Barium sulfate is a white precipitate. There are other ways we can form barium sulfate. Uh, we could use barium chloride which is also soluble in water uh, and sulfate part can may come from potassium or sodium salt, or it doesn't necessarily have to come from a salt. Uh, dilute sulfuric acid solution contains sulfate ions, so we can use that as well. So this specific paragraph actually gives you a very good idea. If you are supposed to use salts, yeah, fine. You can go with nitrates of the metal part and uh, the sodium or potassium of the non-metal parts, understandable. But if they bound you not to use a salt, try thinking of an acid whenever it comes to the negative part or the anion of the system, okay? And in the same way, if the cation is a little bit difficult to think, try thinking of the alkali, such as sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, okay? So, uh, this would be the ionic equation for barium sulfate. It's a white press plate. Let's go for a practical activity where we are supposed to prefer, uh, prepare a pure dry sample of lead to sulfate. So we're gonna take 45 cubic centimeter of the nitrate in a beaker in another separate one, take a solution of sodium sulfate, the same amount. Amounts doesn't really matter as we'll get rid of any excess later. So a white precipitate of lead to sulfate would form as we know the reaction behind it. The reaction mixture is filtered. A white residue of lead to sulfate is left on the filter paper. A colorless solution of filtrate, which consists of sodium nitrate and water, or any excess reactants, passes through into the beaker in the conical flask. The white residue in the filter paper is the compound we want, but it is contaminated with solutions of sodium nitrate in the reactant that was in excess. So a simple washing step would do the trick. Wash the residue with distilled water by pouring a 20 cubic centimeter portion. The amount is not important. You can pour a little less, a little more, but a little more would always be in the favor of getting the purest amount. Into the filter paper, allow uh, it to filter through the paper. This washes away everything that is soluble and just keeps the our insoluble salt on the filter paper. This should be repeated several times to make sure our sample is not contaminated with anything, hence the amount is not important. Uh, doing it in parts uh, with smaller amounts is a better idea rather than doing with uh, all in with a larger amount of liquid. So we would suggest that you do it 
three to four times with 20 cubic centimeter of water rather than using 40 cubic centimeters in one day. That's actually very beneficial. Surface area is the factor considerable over here. Now, when we transfer the filter paper and like to sulfate to warm oven, you can dry it. Uh, that's actually to make sure that it dries in the water evaporates. You can do it in the fan, you can do it under the sun, you can do it in an oven. But remember, when you're doing it under the sun, make sure your salt is not photochemically active. We usually sulfur with silver salts, that's the problem that they decompose photochemically. While under, keep it drying it in the fan or in an oven is a good thing, but drying it in a fan may be a risk-free process. Uh, it takes a lot of time. On the other hand, oven is the fastest way to get it done. We must wash the uh, lid to sulfate with the still pure water because tap water contains dissolved substances. We wash it with tap water. Of course, we are going to contaminate the salt ourselves. So let's go through a simple summary of making the salts. If the salt is soluble, yes, it's maybe a potassium, sodium, or ammonium salt, then yes, use the titration method because that's the one of the best methods that we can use are sodium, potassium, or ammonium soluble salts, all right? And remember in titration method, as we have discussed before, the titration has to be repeated without the indicator in order to get the pure salt. That's a pretty important point in there. Now, if the salt's not soluble, you can use the precipitation method, mix two solutions, uh, use the correct ions, and uh, you are good to go. If the salt is soluble, but it's not potassium, sodium, or ammonium salt, react an acid with an excess of solid, uh, which is suitably reactive. A metal oxide, a hydroxide, or carbonate would work. And remember, this is more like a crystallization process. So you first go with the reaction, then you go with the filtration, uh, evaporation of excess water, and there is a proper crystallization point when it, that appears. You are actually supposed to stop it and dry it properly in order to get the hydrated salt. If you heat it up a little more instead of getting the hydrogen salt, you might end up with the anhydrous salt. That's something we discussed in the previous chapter. So that's 